All right, good evening, everybody. Thank you all for coming down tonight. We are live from Books and Books in Coral Gables, Florida. So a note to our internet audience watching at home, if you're interested in tonight's book, uh, we could ship it to wherever you are in the US free of charge. Just call the number on your screen. This evening, Books and Books is very happy to present Mr. Mark Bailey and his new book, Of All the Gin Joints. Mr. Bailey is an author and Emmy-nominated screenwriter. His books include Tiny Pie, his first children's book, and Hemingway and Bailey's Bartending Guide to Great American Writers, an illustrated tribute to the golden era of hard-drinking literary figures. He also wrote American Hollow, an examination of contemporary Appalachian poverty and companion to an HBO documentary feature of the same name. In addition to books, Mr. Bailey writes documentary and scripted features. His documentary films have been broadcast on HBO, Lifetime, Court TV, and The Learning Channel. This year he received a Primetime Emmy nomination for Ethel, an HBO documentary feature about the life of Ethel Kennedy. Prior to that, he received a Primetime Emmy nomination for Pandemic, Facing AIDS, an HBO five-part documentary series. And his most recent film, Last Days in Vietnam, was recently nominated for an Academy Award for Best Documentary. In this book, Mr. Bailey has pillaged the vaults of Hollywood history and lore to dig up the true and often surprising stories of 70 of our most beloved actors, directors, and screenwriters at their most soused. Films with the most outrageous booze-soaked stories are featured, along with the legendary watering holes of the day. And if a star had a favorite cocktail, the recipe is included. Here to tell us more about it, please give a very warm welcome to Mr. Mark Bailey. OK, great. Um, thank you guys for coming. It's good to be here. And uh, I've heard a lot of amazing things about books and books, so it's great to to finally have made it here. Um, I'm going to do uh, some reading from, uh, from my book of all the gin joints. And um, I'll tell you a little bit about how all the gin joints came into being. Uh, it was done with my partner, Ed Hemingway, who uh, is um, a fantastic illustrator and children's book author. And um, years ago, we... Uh, did a book called Hemingway and Bailey's Bartending Guide to Great American Writers. And that was our first book. And uh, Eddie had come up with the idea. Uh, his, his grandfather um, is Ernest Hemingway. And I think the idea of sort of a hard drinking writer had long been, um, I don't know, in the ether of his childhood, let's say. So uh, Ed came up with the idea. And, and, and that book came out and went well and, and decided to do a follow up. And our uh, uh, we, we, we came upon the idea. By then I had moved out to Los Angeles. I was living in Hollywood and working as a screenwriter. So we came up with the idea of, of doing a book on Hollywood and drinking. And we didn't really uh, realize at the time that we sort of had a tiger by the tail. And so it took about five years to get this book uh, done and turned in. Um, so much liquor sort of went down in Hollywood over the last, you know, uh, 100 years or so that just the research alone took about, you know, three and a half years. So um, we combed through uh, uh, autobiographies and memoirs and interviews and uh, biographies and books of letters and found a bunch of fun stories, some which are better known than others. And also where we could dug up favorite cocktails and worked with some mixologists, um, a couple of great guys who own and, and, and run um, a club in uh, Los Angeles called Ibano's Crossing. And we worked with these mixologists on the cocktail recipes. And so the book has a bunch of stories and sort of spans from the silent era through uh, the studio era and the post-war and into the 70s and the new Hollywood and folks like uh, Montgomery Cliff and Elizabeth Taylor and uh, Robert Mitchum. So it's a big, it's a big long run. And uh, as for the drinks, you know, some of the drinks are pinned to famous places, which we talk about in the book. So 
Um, you know, the famous Brown Derby in the Brown Derby cocktail or the Cock and Bowl, which was the place where the Moscow Mule was invented, a great drink with vodka and ginger beer. Um, uh, and on to sort of the tiki craze of Don the Beachcombers, which had the zombie and, um, let's see, Trader Vic's and the Mai Tai. So places in the cocktails. And then, and then we would also do, uh, if celebrities had a particular drink that they liked, you know, we would, we would try and figure out the recipe for that. So, and some of those I'll talk about in this reading, but Humphrey Bogart and his bourbon milk punch, which he liked to serve on Christmas Day, or Richard Harris would mix um, port with brandy. Um, the director, Preston Sturgis, liked to drink tea with a liquor called Applejack, which is made only in New Jersey and is kind of like a apple brandy. Um, and so with those particular celebrity favorites, we would work and try and come up with a recipe that was somewhere between really good and at least palatable. So, um, and some of them you may want to just try once and, and just sort of know that you've tried that. But, but others are, are, are really, really neat cocktails. So, um, so the book is kind of broken up into these little stories or anecdotes with quotes and, and I'll, I'll dip into a couple of them. And I'll start um, with, I, I should also mention, because I was talking about Ed Hemingway and sort of the, the genesis of the book, uh, Ed has done amazing illustrations. And so he has uh, fantastic portraits of each of the stars. And what he did was he sort of drew them a little bit wonky looking, as though you were looking at them through the bottom of a, of a whiskey glass or maybe were a little bit loaded yourself. So they're kind of a little bit, um, a little bit wonky. And uh, he drew cocktails in a lot of the old places, like the Chateau Marmont or the Polo Lounge or things like that that we wrote about. So it, it's, it's the, the, you know, they sell the, the, it as a Kindle, which has been out there and kind of doing great and is a neat new thing that has come along since we did our last book. But having the actual book itself is really worth it because it's really a beautiful book. Um, so I'm going to start with Humphrey Bogart, who, you know, said famously the line of all the gin joints in all the world, and start with an anecdote by Bogart, who I kind of think more than anybody encapsulates the, both the glamour of Hollywood and its sort of hard-drinking spirit. Um, the Bogart quote that we have in the book is... Uh, uh, the, the problem with the world is they're all three drinks behind me, which is sort of something that I can... Um, okay. It wasn't a joke, but it damn well should have been. Certainly it began like one. So Humphrey Bogart walks into a bar with two stuffed pandas. Bogart was by then, and this is September 1949, the biggest movie star in the world. And he's out in New York with an old drinking buddy, a guy named Bill Seaman. And they've been carousing since early, the two of them, and Bogart's wife, Lauren Bacall. But now it's getting late, and, and Bacall decides she needs to go back to the hotel. She's had enough. But the two men want to press on. What they think they need right now, with the absence of Miss Bacall, is a stand-in, a sort of buffer that will, that will stand in between, that, that will be a buffer between them and any would-be, you know, homewreckers or crazed female fans or anything like that. So somehow it emerged that a nearby delicatessen sold a historically random non-food item, as delicatessens have a way of doing, stuffed pandas. And not just any stuffed pandas, mind you. Each of these weighed in at more than 20 pounds and set you back 25 bucks a pop. Perfect. Bogart and Seaman bought a couple of stuffed pandas and they hopped a cab to El Morocco, where they requested a table for four, two seats for them and two for their pandas. They were seated, and that was supposed to be the end of it, getting seated with two pandas. Unfortunately for Bogart, the real end would take four days to arrive, and it wouldn't be over drinks with his friends. It'd be in court. <laughs> Here's the thing. Bogart was a gregarious man with a keen sense of humor, but he was only comfortable among friends, and his social circle was tight-knit. The Rat Pack, later so closely associated with Frank Sinatra, was in fact Bogart's creation, 
with Bogart at the center. The mission of the group, Bogart said, was the relief of boredom and the perpetuation of independence. Bacall was a member, of course. So was Sinatra, Judy Garland, Spencer Tracy, talent agent Swifty Lazar, writer Nathaniel Benchley, who was the son of Bogart's old friend, Robert Benchley. They were all part of the original Humby Hills Rat Pack. You might see them out at Romanoff's or on rare occasion in Las Vegas, drinking and carrying on. But if you weren't part of the pack, you were an outsider and you weren't welcome. Which brings us back to the pandas. If you were to spy Bogart at a nightclub in the wee hours of the morning, propping up an oversized stuffed animal, you might think it was a not so subtle message about the company he preferred to keep. And if you knew anything about Bogart, which you might, since he was more or less the biggest star in the world, you wouldn't consider yourself in on the joke. But a young model named Robin Roberts thought she was special, as young models often do. She approached Bogart's table on her way out, laughed, and picked up one of the pandas. And Bogart, given the number of drinks he'd put away at this point, he was well in his cups, happened to be feeling very protective of his panda. So he naturally pulled the panda close to him and told Ms. Roberts to leave him alone, for he was a married man. And then the woman fell over. He said, she said he shoved her. He said she lost her balance. Four days later, he was in a Manhattan courtroom facing legal action. The panda fiasco, as it was known, <laughs> immediately hit the tabloids, with Bogart protesting his innocence every step of the way. One reporter asked if he'd struck Ms. Roberts. He said he would never hit a woman. They're too dangerous. Another reporter asked if he was drunk at the time of the incident. He replied, isn't everyone at 4 a.m.? <laughs> Fortunately for Bogart, the judge presiding over the case found it as ridiculous as he did, throwing it out after the first hearing. It turns out being left alone when you're the biggest star in the world requires a lot of people. So that's a little story about Bogart. And then on the next page, I have a recipe for one of his favorite drinks, um, which is the bourbon milk punch, which he would serve on Christmas Day. I'll read a little bit about that. Um, Bogart famously, his, his, his last words, um, or so it's been reported, were, I never should have switched from scotch to martinis, um, <laughs> which is pretty great. It rivals um, Tallulah Bankhead's last words, which were, she was shouting for her home nurse, was uh, bourbon, codeine. And that was, <laughs> that was <laughs> lights out after that. Um, New Year's Eve was, one of the, was the one night of the year Humphrey Bogart wouldn't get drunk for the simple fact that everybody else would. Still, that did not hold true for other celebrations. At the Bel Air wedding to his third wife, actress Mayo Mathote, described as, quote, a blend of Zelda Fitzgerald and Tugboat Annie, they served black velvets. And black velvet's actually a cocktail we have in this book, which is um, it's stout beer and champagne, which sounds really kind of horrible, but it's, it's actually kind of nice. Um, anyways, the A-list wedding quickly degenerated into a drunken free-for-all, ending with the newlyweds, soon to be christened the battling Bogarts, spending their wedding night in different beds, in different countries, in fact. Drunk and angry, Bogart had driven off with his pals to Tijuana. It would be a disastrous marriage, and Mayo would actually at one point stab Bogart, um, which in a sort of a fight at, at their home, and I always liked the fact that the first person Bogart called, having been stabbed, was his agent. So I, that's, that's a real professional. Um, there's also an amusing Easter Day story as, uh, as well. Bogart was, was spo supposed to speak at the Easter service, which was being held at the Hollywood Bowl. The night before, however, turned out to be a real humdinger, bogey tossing back scotch until well past four in the morning around which time he was expected to show up at the amphitheater. He walked onto the stage, still tight, and he launched into a remarkably powerful recitation of the Lord's Prayer. The crowd at the Hollywood Bowl was brought to tears, rushing the star afterwards, but he could only stammer, I need to puke. As for Christmas, Christmas happened to be Bogart's birthday too, and that was truly a make mine a double affair. So bourbon, and, bourbon milk punch was the cocktail of choice. It was a Yuletide tradition in the Homby Hills home he shared with his fourth and last wife, Lauren McCall. The bourbon milk apparently helped with Bogart's hangovers, that throbbing, 
queasy, altogether uncomfortable hour that would come after he stopped celebrating Christmas and before his birthday party had begun. So it's, this is a, that's a really lovely drink, the bourbon milk punch, that you make up in a batch and you just put it in the fridge and it gets nice and cold and then when you have folks over, you know, you pour them over the rocks and you sprinkle a little nutmeg on it and it's great. Um, okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move now to um, a, great, a great actress, Ava Gardner, who is one of the most kind of, um, I don't know, powerful, fierce um, people and drinkers in this book. I really love the Ava Gardner stories. Um, I love Ava Gardner's quote. It might be my favorite in the book. It is, um, a party isn't a party without a drunken bitch lying in a pool of tears. Um, <laughs> so I like that. Um, we had a wonderful time. That was all she would say, Ava Gardner and Frank Sinatra. Um, they had met before, I'm sorry, right, let, me re, let me start again. We had a wonderful time. That was all she would say. Ava Gardner and Frank Sinatra had met before, years ago, at Macombo, back when she was still married to Mickey Rooney. Sinatra had led with a soft open, something to the effect of wishing he'd gotten to her first. Gardner found him charming. They bumped into each other a few times since, at various nightclubs, and there was the time she agreed to be a cheerleader for his charity baseball team, the Swooners. There'd even been a dinner date once, after she'd left Artie Shaw. They'd kissed a bit at the end of the evening, but he was still married to Nancy and had kids, so she hadn't let it go so far. This time, though, was different. They were at Daryl Zanuck's house in Palm Springs for a party. It was fall 1949. Sinatra, as usual, was flirting with her like crazy. She put up with it for a while, then reminded him once he got too pushy that he was still married. No, he insisted. He and Nancy were finished, for good. And seeing as he was now available, would she be interested in going for a drive? Gardner grabbed a fifth of whatever for the road. While Sinatra quite famously had a predilection for Jack Daniels, to Gardner, the type of booze hardly mattered. It all tasted like hell to her anyway. So bottle in hand, she climbed into Sinatra's Cadillac convertible, and the two of them sped off into the desert night, swigging all the way. By the time they came to a stop in the little town of Indio, the streets were deserted. Sinatra pulled her close. They kissed and kissed. And at some point during their escalating passion, Sinatra reached into his glove compartment and pulled out a gun. Scratch that. He pulled out two guns, both Smith & Wesson 38s. Naturally, they began to shoot up the streetlights, a hardware store window, several rounds that ended up who knows where. Sinatra hit the accelerator, and they kept on shooting, all the way back to the highway. It was a few hours later when Sinatra's publicist, Jack Keller, received a phone call from the Indio police station. They had a story that hadn't yet reached the press. Not just a story about Frank Sinatra's drunken arrest, but a story of his drunken arrest while out with a famous actress who wasn't his wife. And if Keller wanted to keep it under wraps, he would need to get to Indio fast. The police back then were so much more amenable. <laughs> Keller immediately called a friend who managed the Hotel Knickerbocker, borrowed $30,000, and took a flight out of Burbank. By early morning, he'd paid off anyone who might be inclined to talk to the cops. The hardware store owner, saw some poor schmuck who'd been grazed with one of the bullets, a couple of cops. Sinatra and Gardner were released without further incident. Gardner, for her part, denied any of this ever happened. When she returned to the house she was renting in Palm Springs and her older sister, Bappy, asked how her night with Sinatra had been, all she said was, we had a wonderful time. <laughs> um, so, so Gardner's drink is one of those drinks that you know, maybe you want to just try once. Um, for a, for a notoriously fierce drinker, Ava Gardner never much enjoyed alcohol. There were years in which she would sort of wander parties two-fisted with a glass of liquor in one hand and in one hand a bottle of Coke to drown it out. However bad it may have tasted to her, Gardner did enjoy being drunk. Forget wine and beer, they were way too slow. Even cocktails were too diluted. Gardner was a gal who liked to get hammered and get hammered fast. And her drink of choice was a concoction of her own invention that she called Mommy's Little Mixture. Uh, Mommy's Little Mixture is a recipe. It comes out different every time. Very simple. 
you dump every type of liquor you can find into a jug or a pitcher or a punch bowl, and then you just suck it down. And so that sort of was, that's was Gardner's. The years later, a book came out a, a couple of years ago, a great book of interviews. Um, I can't remember the fellow's name who, who wrote that book. He interviewed Gardner over a period of time and sort of just released the tape interviews with her. And looking back on her life, one of the comments she made was, um, a lot of alcohol under the bridge work, which I thought was, was a, pretty good, a pretty good line. All right, I'm going to read one more. And this is, um, this is one of my favorites, too, Richard Harris, who's Irish. A lot of the sort of, um, a lot of the English-Irish generation, the angry young men generation who came up after the Lawrence Olivier's and the Gilgoods, these sort of working class guys like uh, Richard Burton and Richard Harris and Oliver Reed and, you know, um, Peter O'Toole and, uh, you know, Alan Bates were really kind of hard-living guys and um, really fun uh, to sort of read about. Harris's quote is, I often sit back and think, I wish I'd done that and find out later that I already have. <laughs> um, okay. They were cutting it too close. The stagehand was in a panic. It was the middle of a performance of the play The Pier at the Bristol Old Vic, and as usual, Richard Harris and Peter O'Toole had ducked out for an unscheduled intermission. Enthusiastic and dedicated drinking buddies, Harris and O'Toole were blessed each night with one glorious 20-minute stretch during which neither man was required on stage. It was long enough to dash across the street in full costume to the local watering hole. Ordinarily, they would toss a few back while keeping a close eye on the clock and return to the theater just before they were due back on stage. But not this night. Harris, the stagehand screamed, throwing open the door of the bar. For God's sakes, you're on. In his professional life, Harris wasn't known to allow drink to interfere with his work. In his personal life, however, he was known for his disappearances. Once, while living in London, he told his wife Elizabeth he was going out for a newspaper. What he didn't tell her was that he was going to get it in Dublin. <laughs> Five weeks of a massive bender passed before word got to him that Elizabeth was planning to divorce him. When he finally returned home and an expressionless but clearly very angry Elizabeth met him at the door, he asked, as sincerely as he could, why didn't you pay the ransom? Of course, that was Dublin, a city that holds you hostage. It held the same alert, Dublin, for O'Toole as it did for Harris. With Dublin, quote, the only thing you can do is turn up the collar of your coat, pull your hat down over your eyes, and walk straight through it. Otherwise, you'll be there forever. There's another fun story involving a Harris disappearance. Extremely loaded one night, Harris first closed down a pub in London. You know how they shut the pubs down at 11.30 or 12. It was sort of a regulation. He first closed down this pub in London, and then, still thirsty for more, Harris hopped a train car in the hope that the train's bar car might still be open. It, it was open, and so Harris never bothered to ask where the train was heading. He arrived in Leeds well after midnight, pissed out of his mind. Spying a light on in a nearby house, he tossed a stone at the window pane and drew out the owner. Naturally, the owner was angry at first, but then he recognized the movie star and he invited him in. Harris would stay there for the next four days, <laughs> bomb the entire time. The, the woman, the wife of the man, eventually called home, called Elizabeth and said, you know, we have had your husband here for four days. And Elizabeth said, keep him. <laughs> um, but when it came to acting, both Harris and O'Toole knew their priorities, and so the two Irishmen slammed back their beers and took off for the theater. Just as Harris hit the stage door, he heard his cue and frantically scrambled toward the stage. His entrance, however, did not go as planned. Right as he was about to peer on set, he tripped over a wire, sliding all the way down to the footlights, where his head landed practically in the lap of a woman in the front row. Catching the scent of alcohol on his breath, the woman shouted, Good God, Harris is drunk. Madam, Harris replied without missing a beat, if you think I'm drunk, wait until you see O'Toole. <laughs> um, anyway, so Harris could drink. I mean, he could really, he really could put it away. He could drink two bottles of vodka a day. Burton could drink three. But, you know, that isn't in, you know. So 
Harris would drink his vodka through the day, and he would, he would finish by seven, and then he would break open a bottle of port and a bottle of brandy, and he would mix the two. And so we have created a recipe for that, which is one that you might try and, you know, have a cigar with it, see how it goes. <laughs> um, so that's a, that's a good... Uh, it's a good little hair story. So, um, I don't know. Uh, you guys want one more? Sure. All right, one more. I'm going to do one more, and I'm going to try, try and figure out where the heck it is. I'm going to do um, Lee Marvin. Let me just try and find him. Okay. Here's Lee Marvin. We'll do Lee Marvin. Um, here's the, uh, the Lee Marvin quote is, tequila, straight. There's a real polite drink. You keep drinking until you finally take one more and it just won't go down. Then you know you've reached your limit. So a very tough guy, <laughs> hey, Marvin. Um, just start driving. He'll come down. At least that was the logic. Director John Borman and his wife, Christelle, had just finished dinner with Lee Marvin at Jack's at the Beach in Santa Monica. Well, that's not entirely true. It had started at di as dinner, but the hour was now 2 a.m., and Marvin was ripped on martinis. They'd all arrived together in Marvin's car, which he now insisted on driving, even though Borman was trying to take away his keys. Fuck you, Marvin had said, rearing back, gesturing with an imaginary samurai sword. This was a man who had made 21 beach landings in the South Pacific during World War II. Still, the imaginary sword didn't prevent anyone from getting into the car, and so Marvin persisted. He felt he was completely capable of driving, and to demonstrate this, he climbed up onto the top of the vehicle like an orangutan and crouched on the luggage rack. Pity, poor John Borman. The British filmmaker was directing his first American feature, Point Blank, with Lee Marvin as the lead. Borman was as yet untested. He was also rewriting the script on the fly, since Marvin had thrown the original shooting draft, based on the pulp, no pulp novel The Hunter, out the window. Locations were being scouted, sets were being designed, and still no one knew exactly what they were filming. Borman would regularly meet with Marvin at his Malibu beach house to apprise him of his progress. The meetings typically went well, unless Marvin had too much to drink. As Borman would write, beyond a certain level of vodka, he sailed out on his own into deeper waters where no mortal would follow. Indeed, when drunk, Marvin left everyone behind, often even himself. One morning, he arrived home from an all-nighter without his house keys. After ringing the bell, he was greeted at the door by an unfamiliar woman. When he asked what she was doing in his house, she replied, You sold it to me three months ago. <laughs> he had to buy a star map to figure out where he currently lived. <laughs> Prior to Point Blank, Marvin had been in Vegas for production of The Professionals, one night, returning to his hotel after a long day's shooting in Death Valley, he'd put quarter after quarter into a slot machine he couldn't get to work, not realizing it was actually a parking meter. <laughs> Anyways, the luggage rack. Marvin's car was parked at the end of a pier jutting out into the ocean. Borman figured if he drove the length of the pier, he could demonstrate he was serious about this, and Marvin would relent. So he gave it a shot, to no avail. Before reaching the actual road, Borman got out and asked Marvin if he was ready to come down. Marvin snarled. Borman got back behind the wheel. It was late. The Pacific Coast Highway was practically deserted, and Marvin had left him no choice. Borman turned onto the highway and slowly headed toward Marvin's beach house. It wasn't long before rolling lights appeared in the rearview mirror. <laughs> the police. Borman pulled over. An officer approached the car, assessing the scene. Finally, he looked at Borman and asked his first question. Do you know you have Lee Marvin on your roof? <laughs> um, all right. So that gives you a taste of some of the stories and, you know, some of the lives of these guys. Big, big personalities with big appetites. So um, the book is, you know, it's meant really to be kind of a celebration of all of that. I mean, I think that we uh, definitely don't shy away from some of the sadder, more tragic stories or, or sides to that lifestyle. Um, and I think it gives a complete picture of that. But it also is meant to be a, a kind of, I don't know, playful look back that 
that sort of remembers different, a different time in the States when people drank in a different way, maybe, for better and worse. So I don't know if anybody has any questions. The thing I always wonder about is alcohol, is that why it is some people can drink and some people can't. Yeah. Um, you mean John Wayne was a good example of a man who could hold his liquor. Yeah, he's give, an, him, give him that, that shot of scotch, and he, he always felt better. Yeah, Other people he's one drink here. and they're ruined for the. For yeah, the, yeah. Um, I well, you know, I I'm I'm no, you know, I can just give you my kind of from reading the stories and and and, and general life experience, um, which I have a little of. Uh, uh, it's amazing the guys who were big drinkers and women generally had an enormous capacity for alcohol. Like they could just drink a ton and you wouldn't show it. And they would keep going and eventually it would show. But guys like Mitchum or um, Burton, you know, I was talking to the historian of the Beverly Hills Hotel, which is Burton and Taylor, spent a heap of time there. And he said how they, for their bungalow, they had a standing order to deliver two liters of vodka at lunch and two more liters at dinner. Oh. And, you know, they both could just, yeah, so I think it's, I think it's genetic. I think it's your makeup. I think it's the same, also, the bounce back. A lot, you know, a lot of these folks said, Burton, for one, said he never had a hangover until he was 45. You know, the recovery time was much quicker. So um, I think a lot of it is just in your wiring. Well, you mentioned Sam Peckinpah. Is that, is that, yeah, Peckinpah is in here. He yeah. should not be listed as the director of Major Dundee. He was too drunk to direct. Well, there's a, there's a fun quote in here. <laughs> I think the quote's by um, Coburn, which is, uh, for four hours a day, he was a genius. For the rest of the time, he was a drunk. You know? <laughs> so he sort of would start in the morning, and he'd build up, and he'd be just in his sweet spot from like 11 to 3. And by then, it would have tipped over. He'd keep going. So yeah, we have Peckinpah here, and we talk about it. He liked on one of his sets, the getaway, the prop master would walk around with one of those racks that sort of beer and peanut guys carry at baseball games. And it was just filled with every, all these different bottles. And he would just walk around the set and peck and paw, would grab the Campari and grab the, you know, soda and make his thing. So it was a different time for sure. But It's amazing that some of these guys lasted as long as they did with yeah. the, how hard they hit it. Yeah, well, some of them lasted. <laughs> some of them didn't last so long. I mean, by today's standards, they didn't last so long. But yeah. You know, I have a sort of, it's like a classic Q&A period question, but I find myself really wondering it about this book, is that during your research, was there something about a particular person that really surprised you, or was there something that came up that would have been the last thing you were expecting? You know, it's a little, um, an anecdote or a situation that just blew your mind? No, some of the people, uh, I mean, you know, we went into this and uh, the people in this book, they had big personas, right? And part of that was wrapped around drinking. People knew Bogart drank, they knew Clark Gable drank, they knew John Wayne or Elizabeth Taylor. I mean, it was just known. So I went in there kind of expecting a certain level of intensity and commitment. Um, I think it, overall it surprised me how much, um, you know, the, the sort of the craziness and the level that it got to. Um, I, this, was, there, was there a person that did not necessarily have a reputation for being a big drinker and you discovered that they were? Well, for me <laughs> that I didn't know, you know, like the Stan Laurel. I didn't yeah, exactly. know. Stan Laurel's <laughs> in this book. And Stan Laurel was surprising because <laughs> He was a crazy drinker, but he was also crazy with w women and wives. He sort of married four wives, but one he married that twice. Tend to go hand in hand. Yeah, they can maybe they go a little bit just together. Just, just a little, yeah. <laughs> right. So he had all these wives, and, and then he would like kind of forget when he, he wouldn't really divor have divorced one, and he'd marry another. <laughs> and there'd be a situation, he'd have to get the marriage annulled and go, you know. So, um, and so he was, you know, and there's some fun, like, just on the, like, Tallulah Bankhead, who wasn't a, you know, isn't a person who I'd spent much time reading about before this, was just such, like, a great, forward, kind of radical woman. You know, her quote in this book is, um, uh, Dad, Daddy always warned me about men and alcohol, but he never said nothing about women and cocaine. And, and she sort of described herself as um, pure as driven slush. 
But you know, and 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 you know, and ambisextrous. So she kind of was like this, you know, and she was, I mean, she sort of did what she wanted, and um, so in way early, right? And so you you kind of like that. You look back and you think, you know, you imagine um, those times as thirties or whatever as being so much more square, and 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 yet here was this oversized woman living in this, you know, pretty public life. Um, so yeah. What was the research like? Um, the research was, the research went well. I had a lot of help. I got a lot of, had a lot of different young folks researching and I write other things. I write scripts mostly. And so it was done across time and it would come in and then, um, and it, you know, it's just, you, it was the kind of research where the trouble is you get pulled into the <laughs> larger story and you spend, you know, an hour and a half reading somebody's biography and then, or, or, or memoirs. And a lot of the memoirs are, are really great. Um, hearing the voices, you know, uh, Errol Flynn's My Wicked Wicked Ways, I think is probably my favorite sort of celebrity memoir, which he had wanted to title In Like Me. Apparently, but they didn't let him do that anyway. <laughs> so, um, but the research it took a while, but it was it was it was fun. Do you have any stories that uh, didn't pass the test? Um, I don't know that we have stories. That, I don't know that we have the stories that we have. There are a couple of people who were very big drinkers, and really sad, and it was hard to find a story. You know, Robards I like a lot. Jason Robards and. Um, he gave it up later in life, but the, the stories I found about him weren't so, he didn't seem like so fun, or George C. Scott, you know, was not, or um, Alan Ladd seemed like a terribly sad guy. So they didn't, I didn't, I didn't put them in, you know, um, but, uh, but yeah, most of them who, and then there were some who were really fun, but maybe they weren't big enough stars, and then they kind of find their way in other stories, like Broderick Crawford who was uh, sort of a giant actor, and he played, um, he was very famous for playing Lenny in Of Mice and Men on Broadway. And he was in a, he was in a movie called uh, Not As a Stranger. And the movie had this phenomenal cast, because I think Mitchum said it wasn't so much a cast as a brewery. The, it was like the, the USS Olympic team of drunks. I mean, it was, um, it was Mitchum, it was this Lon Chaney Jr., it was um, uh, uh, Sinatra, Broderick Crawford. I mean, in the set was mayhem, you know, like stars ripping phone from walls and getting into fistfights with each other. And Sinatra was kind of this scrawny guy, and he kept riding Broad Crawford, that's what they called, you know, and he'd call him Lenny from Of Mice and Men, who was, you know, and, and so mentally challenged, and he, he kept calling him Lenny. And finally, Broad Crawford had enough, and he just, just, decked Sinatra and the two of them <laughs> started going at it and they're fighting on set and then Broad Crawford rips off Sinatra's toupee and he starts eating it right? <laughs> and so he's eating Sinatra's toupee and then he starts to choke on it and and then they had to bring these medics onto the set and they have to sort of like get the hair out of Broad <laughs> Crawford's throat and and um you know, and then they have to hold up filming, right? It has to stop until they can get Sinatra a new rug, which doesn't, I don't think I don't like that. So, um, so like, Brad Crawford's a fun guy, but he wasn't, he didn't get his own kind of thing. He shows up in other people's stories. You also mentioned earlier that in the book you try to present the whole picture of the effect that the drinking life had. Yeah. And um, I was browsing through the book before, and one of the people you mentioned is Ollie Reed. Yeah. Who was an extremely talented actor and you argue yeah. that he never became as big a star as his potential because you know he was just too off wild. the wall yeah, yeah. Too, way too wild yeah yeah i mean i might say oliver reed had some anger issues and that those also probably complicated his his rise um because he was you know he was a real kind of told you what he think, thought, take no nonsense guy. And then the drinking, I think he blew up his career a number of times. I think I talk about the time that Steve McQueen came to see him in England, um, in London, for the possibility of starring in a film in the States. And they all went out and all, Oliver Reed got really hammered and threw up on McQueen's um, 
person. <laughs> I guess just threw up on McQueen. Yeah, the, the, the Oliver Reed tidbit I like is uh, that he, he had, he woke up with um, eagle uh, uh, talons tattooed on his penis. He'd gone out on a bender, and so he woke up with this, these eagle talons tattooed. And the way he handled that was that later he got an eagle's head tattooed on his shoulder blade so that when anybody asked about it, he could say, you should see where he's perched. Um, <laughs> uh, so, but yeah, he was, he was a madman. He was a madman, Oliver Reed. Of all the people in this book, he was... Uh, another thing Oliver Reed did, <laughs> he was at a very posh hotel, and in the dining room, it was kind of done in like a, you know, um, lakeside, plant, hanging plants and these sort of pools that they had fish in, and they had all these goldfish in this pool. And he got really drunk at the hotel and came down at night and took all of the goldfish out of the pond <laughs> and put them upstairs in his hotel room bathtub and then took a bunch of carrots and put the carrots in the pool. And then at breakfast... <laughs> In the morning when people were just up and breakfasting, he came down for breakfast, reached into the pond and started eating all the carrots that, you know, that people thought were goldfish. So, which is a long way to go for a prank. Yeah, yeah. So, um, it's, yeah. But there's, you know, anyways, there's some funny stories. There's a Burton story about Burton and Lawrence Olivier getting drunk in Beverly Hills and feeling really dark and desperate about humanity and deciding that they need to see something positive and reaffirm sort of humanity. And so they drive around, both of them loaded, looking for a baby, you know, at like <laughs> two in the morning. And they're knocking on houses, you know. That's this isn't in the book. And they <laughs> so they knock on a house and then finally somebody comes and produces a baby. You know, they've got a baby upstairs and here's Burton and Olivier and they just sort of, you know, see the baby and they feel better about things. <laughs> so, um, craziness. All right. Any, Any more? Or okay. Well, All right, Victor. You. Well, thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you all. So we have of all the gin joints as well as Mark's previous book, Hemingway and Bailey's Bartending Guide to Great American Writers, for sale at the counter over there. He'll be signing here at to the table to the left of the podium. And also... If you show a receipt, when you buy a book, you show the receipt at the bar, you get a free drink tonight. So my apologies to the internet audience, but you have to be at Books and Books tonight to claim your free drink. Uh, still time to buy the copy of the book, and we'll ship it to wherever you are in the U.S. free of charge. Just call the number on your screen. So for those of you here in the house, buy a book, get it signed, have a nice drink at the bar, and let's give Mark another hand. Thanks very much. Thank you, guys. Okay.